what is it missing? So it's missing differentiators. It's missing a story. It's missing what makes your brewery unique. And that's, that's the big thing with a brand. So it can be anything from your personal interests to your values to your story or the kind of beers that you make, where you're located. Any kind of niche is what should really be considered when you're coming up with your mission statement and thinking about who your target audience is and who you're serving. And I included these photos from New Belgium because New Belgium Fat Tire is a great example of this. They built the whole brand just around cycling and cycling enthusiasts. That's their target audience. It's in the logo. It's in their social media. It's on their package design. It's in the events that they do. It's in everything. So here's a more improved mission statement. So to bring the community together by celebrating our city's local history through craft beer. So why is this one better? It expresses shared values with your target audience and creates kind of a goal and a mission outside of just brewing beer. And it creates a story to build on. So, I mean, this is an entirely made up mission statement. Let's say this brewery, they're in a, an old building within Albany, New York that has a lot of history. And, you know, that's, that's their brand and that's their mission. They can then name their beers after some of the history and tell that story. And it's important to include your location in your mission statement as well because, you know, thinking about your target audience, you know, some breweries distribute further out than others. So thinking about who you're speaking to, like you might be in Albany and that might be where your head is, but your customer might be in Buffalo. They might be in New York City. They might be in another state. So something like, you know, you see a lot of Buffalo breweries, do a lot of Buffalo pride. That's great within Buffalo and, you know, your Josh Allen beers and all that, but doesn't necessarily translate depending on where you're, you're distributing. So it's an important factor as well. So brand touch points. This is how you have all of your branding in place. You have your mission statement. You've got your logo. You've got your brand colors. You feel great about everything. So how do you bring that to life? What, how does your consumer experience your brand? So these are some of the ones that I find the most important, especially in talking about craft beer. So, you know, thinking about your staff, that's a very, I think, underappreciated part of the brand experience that people often forget, but they really control the brand experience more than anyone, anything, any logo can do, any website can do, any social media can do. I think staff is first and foremost the experience that people really remember. So then, of course, there's stuff like, you know, your environment of your tap room and what's that like and does that align with your brand versus, you know, having the experience of going to the store and buying the beer and seeing the packaging, seeing your social media, seeing an ad online. Is that all cohesive? Does that all fit? So that's kind of, you know, being consistent and cohesive is really important, especially as you expand and you distribute out further because the further out you expand and the larger your business becomes, the less control you have over your brand. So having all of this stuff in place ahead of time <laughs> is just really important. So this is where I'm gonna get into the fun part. I'm gonna just kind of power through a ton of ideas. Like I said, things that have worked for me that really aren't expensive, that you know, some of them even can make you money more than they cost anything to spend. And you don't need to hire a massive marketing agency to do them. So I think craft beer itself is very grassroots, right? This industry has been that way for a really long time. So being kind of gritty and DIY with your branding and your marketing just really works. So my goal of these is that you guys think about how they apply to your brewery specifically, and you walk away with like two to three really actionable things that you guys can just go and do right now. So first one is talking about organic SEO. So I said that these won't fit for everyone, but this one definitely does. This one is super important, and honestly, it's much easier than people think. And it just takes consistency and repetition, and it's really important for your brand. So what is organic SEO? It's search engine optimization, if you're not familiar. So it's how your website ranks within a search engine and how it performs organically. So everybody, when you go to Google, you see ads up at the top. And that's those businesses that are spending money to be there. And consumers know that. So 
to me, I think it's so much more valuable to be organic and to be naturally at the top because it shows brand trust and it shows that you are a leader in whatever whatever industry people are searching for, whatever business people are searching for. So they're automatically going to trust your brand a lot more just with that simple step. So this is there's a lot with SEO. We could spend a full hour just on this, but just to keep it really short and fast for you guys. You start with the keyword phrase that you want your goal to be. So that could be gluten-free breweries in New York City. It could be dog-friendly breweries in Buffalo, New York. Pick one or two that you want to make sure that your website is always the top hit for. And so some things that easy things that you can do to make that happen is just naturally use those keywords repeatedly throughout your site. Use them on every page. And don't make it so obvious, like work it within your copy naturally, but have that everywhere on your website. Another really easy thing you can do is link to other relevant websites that have similar content that might be in a similar area. You know, you can do this with a blog post, you can do this with, you know, five places to enjoy an XYZ beer and you, you share other web places to go or accounts that you have. Um, but Google likes that. Google realizes that that means you're active and involved outside of just the internet, and that's something that they they use a lot in their ranking. So it's called backlinking. Very easy to do. Another thing is your Google business page. How many people in here claim their page and use it actively? Okay, that's really good. Google business page is a free tool, and it's great for your SEO. So. Even just spending half an hour a week, if you can just set aside a little bit of time to do that each week, that's gonna help your SEO tremendously. You know, doing things like responding to reviews, and when you respond to reviews, using those keywords, because Google reads those too, right? So if you are a dog-friendly brewery, answering those questions, thanks for visiting our brewery with your dog, that's gonna help your SEO. Um, posting more pictures, getting more reviews, um, you can also do posts on Google business page. I don't know if anybody is taking advantage of that. Honestly, the consumer doesn't see them much. I, I don't think it's really caught on yet, but I think it's worth doing more for your SEO than for your actual customers. So what I've always done is if I take one Facebook post a week just to make it simple and mindless and just repeat that, with a photo on your Google business page. Like one big thing that you have happening that week, something that's relevant to your overall brand. And you don't have to put much thought into it, but it really helps your website. So I'm gonna move on to social media. I am not going to tell you to just use social media, because I think we all know that. It's a great free tool to use, but it can be overwhelming, especially if you don't have somebody that's doing it full time in your business. So. Something that I love to do is develop content pillars for your social media, so think about your brand. These examples are pretty generic, you know, kind of can fit everyone. And you can really have fun with them with your brand because this, a content pillar is just for you, it's just for your reference. A customer doesn't need to know what they are. The names can be cheesy to make you remember it, whatever you want that to be. But if you just come up with four to six content pillars and then assign them days of the week, that takes out so much of the mental energy of trying to come up with what to post every day. So you can sit there with your content pillars in front of you, and you could honestly spend maybe two hours scheduling out content on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter lets you schedule out too, for a month's worth of content, and then from there just focus on engaging with people instead of constantly coming up with what to post. So. I think that's just a really easy tip. Um, another thing that I love to do with social media is user-generated content. So this is a great example success story for Gorebox. I was putting in so much effort on social media with coming up, editing photos, taking really high quality photos, scheduling out content, having my goals, looking at my analytics. And the best performing post of 2021 was a photo somebody else took at some other restaurant of a garbage plate with a beer in a corner. So I reposted this, of course credited the user, always make sure to credit if you're gonna do this. Um, posted this photo with the, with the caption, tell us you're from Rochester without telling us you're from Rochester. 
and it got 822 likes and 24 comments, which was more than double what we were getting on any other post. So why is that? I think, you know, for one, Rochester people just love garbage plates, so I guess that could be part of it. But I think more importantly is they like to see, people like to see brands interacting with other people, and they especially like to see their own photos chosen. That makes them feel special, and like they were very creative, and it's just fun for people to see. And when they see that your business does user-generated content a lot, they're more likely to then post about you in hopes that one day their stuff gets chosen. So it's really about building community, building a connection with your brand, and it's easy. Someone else is doing the work for you, and it doesn't cost anything. So thinking about user-generated. And another tip with that that I like to say is I follow hashtags on Instagram, so I don't know if anyone here is doing that. But you can follow hashtags of your own brand name or even on just some of those like keyword hashtags or things that your brand is focused on because that's where you find people that are either posting about you and don't follow you on social media, but they're hashtagging you and not tagging you because they don't know you exist yet. So you can find a lot of user-generated content and connect with people and get those followers by interacting with their posts. But just in general, that's where your people are, right? If they care so much about that stuff to post it with the hashtag online, like those, those are the people that you want. So that's a great way to kind of build up engagement on your social as well. Next, we're going to talk about press. So this is another one that really can work for everyone, but it's just in how you should adapt it to your own brand. And again, I think this is a lot easier than people think. Like press and these brewery websites, they want your stories. They, that makes their job easier. When you come to them with something interesting, with something new, they're constantly looking for that kind of stuff. And that contact information is always very readily available on their websites. So, you know, some of the bigger ones even just have forms, but any local news channel, any kind of outlet like this, you're gonna be able to find the contact information very easily. I have a Google Sheets of all of my contacts organized by local versus state versus industry. So again, it's a super quick tool when I wanna send out a press release. I just have all my contacts right there and it's done. And some tips for creating a press release is to always keep it concise but have an angle. So don't think of these as an advertisement. If you, for example, this, you know, I put this screenshot up here, this is a story that got picked up for Roarbox, and instead of just saying, hey, we're coming out with a new IPA, this is what the description is, this is the beer, you know, we built a story around it. So, you know, the, the whole idea of coming out with this new IPA was that this switch over to kind of the East Coast style IPAs versus West Coast, and you know, why people's tastes have evolved with that and why hops have evolved and something that is like broad to everybody in the industry and interests everyone outside of beyond just here's a new beer. So having an angle like that that's more broad and not just specific to your what's going on with your own business is going to help you get picked up by the press a lot more. And providing photos, too, was another thing that they just appreciate more, and they're more likely to pick it up because, again, it's less work for them, and they don't have to come up with photos themselves to do that. So, I mean, keep them short. Keep them about 100 or 500 words, I'd say, and, you know, keep your who, what, when, where, why, but having that story is really important. And then the other most important thing is that when once you get picked up and once that article is published, that's not where you should stop. That's you know half the job, and so you want to make sure that you're following up with it, linking it on your website. Again, that's great for SEO, um, and just kind of establishes you as a leader. So that's awesome. And then posting it to social media. Again, it's good for your brand to do that. Get more out of it. Share the story, and you know, like for Warbox to say like we were featured in Brewer Magazine is a nice thing to be able to say. So that's press. Next, we're going to talk about staff. So I kind of said this in the beginning, but again, I feel like they're a very underutilized tool for your brand. 
and they should be your strongest brand ambassadors. If they're not passionate about the brand, nobody's going to be, right? So how do you do that? I mean, I think the most obvious thing is to hire right from the start. You know, hire people that share your values and share your passion, and then it kind of just organically happens. But there are a lot of things that breweries should do to help their staff achieve this kind of empowerment and excitement about the brand. And something that I love is, it's called Basecamp, so it's kind of a project management tool slash um, communication tool, and we use it at Roarbox, and I think it just helps everybody get excited and involved and know what's going on, especially for a company like that that had staff in different spots or different shifts, and I'm sure your brewers might have an AB, maybe even a C shift, you know, they're not always on the same page, so. You know, posting things like about the new beers that are coming out, asking them to vote on things. I would always post the package <coughs> sign in there to get everybody's feedback, and that makes them pay attention and get excited, and that's just gonna naturally translate to your customer, right? Because if they know that these things are coming down the line and you're open in your communication with these things, they're gonna then say to their your customer, oh, you like this beer? Well, guess what? In a month, I've got this thing coming out. So. You know, just being open with communication, I think, is the most important thing. Giving them merch, giving them beer, encouraging them to post on social media and to celebrate them on social media. Do staff spotlights every Friday on your social media, something like that. So that's, that's my spiel on staff. So the next idea is beer subscriptions. So this is a really fun way to just repurpose what you already have. Again, it's not very expensive to put this together. You're already releasing these beers throughout the year. So it really just takes a little bit of planning and not a lot of money. And the great thing about it too is you have so much control over the brand experience with this. So you know, by having someone sign up for an annual subscription, you're creating brand loyalty. You're getting them into the door regularly and having their attention for an entire year. So that's a very valuable thing. And there's just so many things that you can do to make this creative for your own brand. So if somebody's coming to pick up this beer that they subscribe to each month, you know, what does that experience look like for them? Do you, do you give them tasting notes? Do you give them stuff like like recipes or food pairings that go with that specific beer? Do you give them a call to action, encouraging them to post it on social media and give them some kind of incentive for it? Make them brand ambassadors too. Um, there's just a lot of things that you can do with that. And you know, another thing with talking about capital, this idea really came out of COVID and you know, kind of coming up with a different way to reach people and it really helps cash flow because what you should do with this is like sell it during holiday season for the year, for the next following year, and then you have all of that money up front. And this not to be too scammy about it, but the reality is is that they're not gonna pick it up every time either. So you're really making money. So of course you don't want that to happen. You want them to pick up the beer ultimately, but this is something that really is, can be very cost effective. Sim similar to the way in a gift card. I think something like 60% of gift cards end up actually being redeemed. It's like wildly low. So beer subscriptions are a really fun tool. My next one is branded glassware. So again, very low, low investment. People love glassware but there's so much you can do with this other than just your logo. So doing specific beers, doing any kind of fun design that's really going to encourage people to post it online and to want to have the glassware is really great. There's just a bunch of ideas you can do with it. I mean, you can do beer releases and the first 50 people get to keep the glass. Guess what, your glassware gets stolen anyway, so it's not a big investment, right? You know, doing giveaways on your social media. It's a great sales tool for distributing, and if you're trying to incentivize a certain beer, or get them to buy a certain volume of kegs, like you get a case of this specialty glassware with your, with your keg, and it doesn't, again, really cost you too much to do that. So, again, just a lot of things that you can do, and it's a relatively cheap piece of 
piece of retail. And the last one I'm gonna talk about is events. And events are just, again, like if you know you have your, your tasting room or your tap room in place, this shouldn't be too terribly expensive to pull off. And it's just a great way to put your brand on display. And you know, you should just think about being intentional with it. Think about that mission statement and what your brewery, what, what your expertise is, what your niche is, and just really drive that home with every event that you choose to make. So some really successful events that I could think of that we've done in the past um, is an Earth Day event with 490 Farmers. It was really great. And you know, the reason that we chose to collaborate with them is because Robots is an urban brewery in downtown Rochester, so we wanted to partner with an urban community garden, which was 490 Farmers. So, you know, just being intentional, but it's at the same time so simple. And I think that's, that's the key with events. Um, another fun story I love to tell, which was also kind of a COVID solution that worked out very well, was I hosted a spring cleaning event, and it was online, kind of like an online garage sale where we just got rid of stuff that we've had sitting around for years and those odd sizes of t-shirts and tap handle stickers from old beers, old tap handles, old posters, older like retired beers, all this kind of stuff and we just kind of you know rebranded it as a fun garage sale thing and as these limited edition kind of items and we ended up making about six thousand dollars on just stuff that we had sitting around in storage that would have been thrown out anyway so it was a great way to make a little money during tight times with covid so you know just being creative with what you already have is always my piece of advice so these are some of my vendor resources that i really like when I'm talking about branding and merchandise marketing all of that stuff, so feel free to take a picture of this, write down anything if you don't already use these. So I'll just go through them for you very quickly. Um, for retail, buy trend printing is in Rochester, but I know they do go outside of that. They've just been a really great partner for merchandise, and they kind of come from a marketing mindset themselves. They work with a lot of craft breweries specifically, so I've always really liked their expertise. Um, that they provide more than just the service of printing your t-shirts. Um, Brewerybranding.com, kind of same thing. If you're not familiar, you know, it's just a great place to get ideas, even if you're not going to buy from like a large company like that. You know, they kind of give you an eye onto what's selling and what's trending, things like that. Sticker Mule is a great, affordable, high quality website that I've always loved to use. Cats America does batch runs of coasters. If you don't use them, they're very, very cost effective because they do just insane sizes of runs at a time. And for digital, Squarespace and Show It are what I like to do for hosting websites. So they are just very user friendly and very easily editable. So when I do websites for my clients, I can just hand these websites off for them to make the changes themselves, which I think, you know, for smaller breweries and places that don't have an in-house person or are on a tighter budget, these are really great solutions for that. Um, Canva, if anyone uses Canva, if you're not a graphic designer, it's a really great tool. As a graphic designer, at first it kind of hurt me because it feels like it's, you know, there's no need for a graphic designer anymore, but there's, it's a great tool for people. It's just the reality of it. So I fully support it. Um, use it if you don't. Creative Market is another one that I just love. You can buy fonts and stuff from um, other designers from all over the world. So the money does go right to them. And it's usually pretty affordable because it's just a digital download. So I've bought all kinds of things on there, like illustrations and yeah, fonts, presentation templates, things like that, that just kind of save you time, which time is money for all of you, right? So it's a great tool. And qrcodegenerator.com is free for up to a certain amount of QR codes. So I think we all know about the resurgence of QR codes after COVID. So I think they're still pretty effective. I don't know how long that trend will last, but I think it's still happening. And you see it a lot with menus and there's a lot more you can do with it, putting it on your package design so that it goes to a cool video about the beer from the beer can 
or doing some clever things like that. So I think that's a really fun, fun branding thing to play with. And then, of course, a plug for the Brewers Association. Take advantage of it. They have so many resources that I feel like members don't take advantage of very much. Um, things with their own holidays and marketing initiatives that you can build a community around. And they do have a press list. So when we were talking about doing those press releases earlier, I got my starting press list from them. I think if you just email, or there might be a download right on the website. Um, I think if you just email them, they'll send that to you, and it's for the entire state. So it's organized by city. It's a really, really helpful tool. <coughs> and that's that. So final tips for you guys. I think, you know, it's just really starting with the why, with your branding, and coming up with your differentiators, and having all of that, like, strongly in place from the start is really going to help you not spend money where you don't need to or not follow trends that don't fit your specific brewery and just keep building that connection you know using what you have we've talked about that with some of the events and things like just repurposing and repackaging what you're already doing and working so hard for and just communicating it in a different way another great example i like to do with that is just prefix flights. So you already have these beers. You know, you are, people are already probably ordering flights at your brewery. So thinking about seasonality or holidays, and again, you're probably already naturally making beer for those things. So coming up with something like a St. Patty's flight, just based on the beers you just have on tap and, you know, giving it a name, taking a nice photo of it and posting it on Instagram, just giving people that idea, like, yes, anyone could go in and order that flight. And, you know, don't charge more for it either. Just re-advertise it in a unique, fun way that's going to get people excited. So, you know, simplicity, consistency is kind of the same concept. Don't be afraid to repeat yourself in social media, in your advertising, in everything. You know, you're the one doing these things, so it feels very repetitive to you. But you have to remember that not everybody is seeing everything that you're putting out there, for one. And for two, I, people don't mind it. They like to know what to expect, and they like that consistency, and it keeps it top of mind. If you have a wood-fired Wednesday promotion, and the first time you post it, someone's not going to come. But after they've seen it 12 times, the next time they have a free Wednesday night, that's what they're going to remember. So consistency can be more repetitive than you think. And the last thing is just finding inspiration for other brands that you like. I do this all the time. I wrote down these ones. These are my favorite three brands. You know, they're outside of New York, so they're not necessarily like direct competitors with anyone that I work with. So, you know, you can kind of find inspiration. And I'm not saying to steal, of course. There's a difference between copying a brewery and finding inspiration, but just seeing the things that they do with their branding and their events and how that looks online is just a really great way to kind of come up with stuff when you're stuck. So, I mean, Allagash just does amazing branding. They have a very high quality. They're a much bigger company, so that, you know, that's part of it. But someone like Creature Comforts, they're out of Georgia, if anyone's familiar. I don't even think they distribute up here, but they just have such great branding and package design, and they have just, a full story like that they really build around called I think their tagline is get comfortable and it's just their whole concept really you can see it in everything that they do so I really admire them for that and then Lamplighter is also very similar they just have so many creative events and use social media really well so give them a follow online if you don't because they're some great inspirational brands and that's really all I have for you guys so Thank you. And again, I don't have a moderator, so I hope you guys have some questions <laughs> based on that. I feel like I moved through it really fast, but is anybody, yeah? Uh, have you found a way to track or see the return from all the branding, all the posts, all the social media, using Google? Yeah. Uh, is there a way that you found to track a financial return or return on investment in the tap rooms? without having to directly ask each customer that comes in and say, how do you hurt us? Is there, 
is there a tool out there that you would know about that could provide so, there probably is. I don't have one that does that far. I mean, the first thing that I think of is just your Google Analytics and like all of those tools do show like the traffic of your website and if people are buying online, you can find that out very directly. Um, Facebook Pixel does the same thing as well if you include that on your Google Analytics. Um, so you know that if somebody's coming from from Facebook that they bought something online, you can have all that data. Um, and you know, like all of the social media has their insights, so you can kind of track that. But as far as like using your Instagram insights and seeing how well a post performs and then how that translates online, I can't think of a specific program that does that, but I feel like if you're paying attention to, okay, like this week, this post did really, really well, and we did have a very busy day in the tap room, and you're looking at the sales online of that day, you can definitely, you have a feeling that that's, that's what that's from, so I hope that helps. Anybody else? Thoughts on TikTok? <laughs> I'm a fan. Okay. I think, I think, <laughs> What's that? I think it's worth delving into, scrap yeah. and TikTok. Yeah, so I think that it's starting, you know, at first it was a lot of young people, so especially for craft beer in the very early stages, I thought it was almost inappropriate because obviously beer is 21 plus. Um, but I think that's changed and I think the older generation is starting to get into it. So I think, you know, that's becoming more of a reason why, but people just love video content too. Like that's kind of the direction that social media is going in. I mean, even Instagram now with reels and stuff, that's what performs better on Instagram too. So I think it's a great way to like come up with some really fun content and it's a great educational tool for your brand, I think, because it's video. You know, you can kind of have a brewer sit in front of the camera for a minute and just tell the story behind the beer. And that is a lot more impactful than just a photo of said beer. So yeah, I'm all for it. And then you can also double up with it too. Like if you're creating that for TikTok, throw it on Instagram too because the reels work the same exact way. So again, you're getting even more out of it. So yeah, big fan of TikTok. <laughs> Um, can you talk a little bit about what to put on the homepage for your, for your brewery and numbers of clicks to get customers to contact? Yeah, yeah, sure. So homepage of your website, I think it goes back to like the whole concept of this with finding your why and what you want your biggest goal to be. So, you know, it depends on if you are focusing on distribution versus focusing on getting people into your tap room. Um, so like, what would you say would be your biggest yeah, goal? Yeah. yeah, so then make that, make a photo of your tap room and have a huge call to action, visit us now with your hours, like make that your homepage, whatever you want. And the less clicks, the better for everything. Like keeping your navigation simple and keeping, like repeating things throughout the website, I think is really important too. Like don't be afraid to put your hours and your address in like five places on your website because that's less work for the customer to have to find that kind of information. Same thing for like your newsletter, like signing up for that, like put it in your footer, but also put it on your contact page and put it on your homepage in a different spot, put it everywhere. So I think, does that kind of answer the question? Yeah. I know we're talking about free stuff, but like when you do get into like spending money on Facebook ads or Google or Yelp, which was supposed to be money, but like what would you suggest like focusing on? Like if we are doing a hundred dollars a month on some sort of ads and then do Google, Facebook, or yeah, so again, I think it goes back to who you're trying to talk to and where you're at, like if you're a very well-established brand and you have a big following on social media and you're just trying to get your post to perform better within that great following that you already have, like spend the money doing that because it is still relatively cost-effective, I think, to run some social media ads. Like throwing 50 bucks on Facebook can get you a pretty good return if you're 
doing your audience correctly. Um, another thing I like to do with Facebook too is um, they do like 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 similar audiences to who you follow, so people with those same interests online, and that that might not like your page, you're reaching those people. So I found that that audience does work really well, and I like that way more than don't ever use um, friends and friends of friends because people's friends on Facebook are it's way too broad and they might have family in South Carolina that are half of their Facebook friends but you only distribute it in New York. It's not a good use of your money so I don't like that one. Um, but, but yeah, I think it just depends on kind of your goal and where you're at on which one you, you ultimately decide on. So then that is where you get into Instagram and Twitter. And yeah, I think there's some truth to that depending on who your audience is. But don't let that broad demographic of craft beer dictate who you're talking to because there's so many people within that bigger audience that's going to be enough for your business. Like I can think of breweries that specifically do market to women. And it's a woman-owned brewery and they celebrate that and there's enough women that keeps their business, you know, alive. And, you know, I think about Rohrbox too that I just worked a lot with. Like, their audience was actually older. They were on like the older spectrum and they were okay with that. Like it worked for them. They're busy, they're very successful and there's nothing wrong with like knowing that. And so Facebook was huge for that. And, you know, they, they're very successful, so. I think, yeah, don't let that dictate, like, not using Facebook, so. Um, just to let you all know that New York State Department of Agriculture has two marketing programs that are totally free, um, <clears throat> and we have marketing grant money that can help you hire somebody like Brittany to even further develop your branding, um, and we have a table up, but it is a free marketing program. Uh, Taste New York and New York State Grants are that's awesome. And it doesn't have to collide with your current marketing. It just gives you funding opportunities, trade show exposure, things like that. Thank you for sharing that. I'm going to have to look into that. Um, uh, I love your uh, Warbox email newsletter. Yes. Can you talk about how email behaves differently as a marketing tool than, say, social media? Yeah, so you do a great job with this as well. Um, Email, I, yeah, that is not something I talked about. I still find that to be a very effective. I feel like people kind of have this impression that email is kind of like on its way out or it's old school. It's kind of like very like, like print advertising and mailers. Like people don't do it anymore. But for the people that love your brand and like really are loyal to your brewery, email is very like the, the return on investment is much higher than social media because you're going like right to the people that care the most. And, you know, for doing things like events and selling things, it is a very effective tool, I've found in my experience. Um, you send an email and within a couple hours you can sell some tickets, which a social media post just is never gonna quite do that same thing. Um, but it is a way to, yeah, build a brand and connect people in other ways. So. When I do that e-blast, I always try to follow a rule of thumb of like include three things. Two of them are about the actual brewery and what's happening there, whether that be an event or a new beer or something. But have that third thing always be like a brand value add. So something that's an interesting piece of news that's going on in the industry or an interesting piece of news going on in the city, you know, something going back to like your brand mission statement and like what your niche is and what you want to focus on. Um, like interesting and fun blog posts or recipes or anything that's like 
entirely has nothing to do with the brewery, essentially, and it's just like a value add to make people want to open that email in the first place and get that info. So, yeah, I'm a huge fan. And I think, I know you do this too, like having consistency with that so that people know when to expect it and almost kind of look forward to it. So whether it's a Tuesday morning or a Friday afternoon, like being consistent with when you send that out is going to help your open rate a lot. Yeah, that's a good one. Anything else? Where are we with time? Anything? Well, I do have my QR code up here for marketing, so I'll do a shameless plug to follow me on Instagram. I do a lot of like posts about inspiration and tips and things like that, so feel free to do that. And thank you all for your time. There's nothing else. Appreciate it.